It is the Resistance Report for November 6th, 2017. We begin tonight by remembering the victims of yet another mass shooting, this time in Sutherland Springs, Texas, where a lone gunman shot down 26 people at a Baptist church during church services yesterday. It's been five weeks since America's deadliest mass shooting in Las Vegas, and just as long since Republicans promised to take a small step to limit this violence by prohibiting bump stocks. That's an aftermarket device that increases the firepower of assault weapons. But nothing has been done. Instead, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, what have they been focused on? Cutting taxes on the rich and lying to the American people that this is a middle-class tax cut. And Donald Trump, meanwhile, embroiled in the wake of the Mueller indictments, has renewed his call to lock up Hillary Clinton. That's what Donald Trump wants to do, he says. He wants to lock her up. It's almost as if there's nothing else on Trump's mind except Hillary Clinton. Again and again, he has said he wants to lock her up. In a radio interview last Thursday, Trump said, the saddest thing is, because I'm the President of the United States, I'm not supposed to be involved with the Justice Department. I'm not supposed to be involved with the FBI, he said. I'm not supposed to be doing the kind of things I would love to be doing. Trump then asked, referring to the Department and the FBI, why aren't they going after Hillary Clinton with their emails with her emails and with her dossier. And then in a series of tweets Friday morning, Trump directly called on the Justice Department and the FBI to do what is right and proper by launching criminal probes of Hillary Clinton. That's what he wants. He was elected president a year ago. He is still obsessing about the person who he defeated, not in the popular vote, but in the electoral vote. And he wants the FBI, FBI and the Department of Justice to go after her. Now, Trump's obvious aim here is to deflect attention from special counsel Robert Mueller's probe of Trump's campaign of, and of the indictments issued against his campaign aides, and also of the growing number of Americans who really do believe the Trump campaign worked with Russian agents. I mean, the evidence is accumulating every day. There's more and more evidence. But here's the thing. By calling on the Justice Department to investigate Hillary Clinton and then lamenting he cannot do the kind of thing I would love to be doing, Trump crossed a particularly dangerous line. In a democracy bound by the rule of law, presidents do not prosecute their political opponents. Nor until now have they tried to stir up public anger toward their former opponents a year after an election. Our democratic system of government depends on presidents putting that democratic system above their own partisan aims. That democratic system, Mr. Trump, is more important than your ego. That democratic system, Donald Trump, is more important to any of us than how you feel today. You were elected by an electoral college in this democratic system. As Harvard political scientist Arkin Fung has noted, once an election is over, Candidates' graciousness to one another is an important demonstration of their commitment to the democratic system over the outcomes they fought to achieve. This, this helps reestablish civility. It helps reestablish social cohesion. It reminds the public that our allegiance is not toward a particular person or a particular party, but to our system of government. 
Think of Al Gore's concession speech to George W. Bush in 2000. This was after five weeks of a bitterly contested election, just one day after the Supreme Court ruled five to four in favor of Bush. I say to President-elect Bush that what remains of partisan rancor must now be put aside, and may God bless his stewardship of this country. Al Gore publicly bowed to the institutions of our democracy. Now the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken. Let there be no doubt, while I strongly disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept the finality of this outcome, which will be ratified next Monday in the Electoral College. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. George W. Bush's response to Gore was no less gracious. Vice President Gore and I put our hearts and hopes into our campaigns. We both gave it our all. We shared similar emotions. So I understand how difficult this moment must be for Vice President Gore and his family. We agreed to meet early next week in Washington. Now it is time to find common ground and build consensus to make America a beacon of opportunity in the 21st century. Many voters continued to doubt the legitimacy of Bush's victory, of course, but there was no social unrest, no civil war. Americans didn't retreat into warring tribes. Think of what might have occurred if Al Gore had bitterly accused Bush of winning fraudulently and blamed the five Republican appointees on the Supreme Court for siding with Bush for partisan reasons. Think of what might have happened if, during his campaign, Bush had promised to put Al Gore in jail for various alleged improprieties, and then after he won, he called on the Justice Department and the FBI to launch a criminal investigation of Gore. These statements, they're very close to the ones that Donald Trump has actually made, they might have imperiled the political stability of this nation. Instead, Gore and Bush made the same moral choice, and it is a moral choice. They made the same moral choice their predecessors made at the end of every previous American presidential election, and for exactly the same reason. They understood that the demonstrations of respect for each other and for the Constitution confirmed the nation's commitment to our system of government, and that this was far more important than their own losses or their own wins. Donald Trump has no such concern. It's all about Donald Trump. He continues to blast Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama every chance he can. A whole year has gone by, almost, since the election. It's almost as if he, Donald Trump, forgets or doesn't even care that more than half of American voters voted for Hillary Clinton in the last election and that America chose Barack Obama twice to be our president. In other words, in effect, Trump continues to act as if he is not president of all the American people, but president of only a particular portion of Americans, those who voted for him, those who cheer for him at his rallies and share his tweets. And it's this underlying assumption by Trump that he's not really president of all of us, that he's, that is doing more than anything to divide this country between Trump supporters and the rest of America. This week, as I say, will mark a year since Trump became president. But instead of governing, Donald Trump has been insulting, throwing tantrums, getting even, equating white supremacists with people who protest against them, questioning the patriotism of NFL players who are peacefully protesting police violence and racism, making nasty remarks about journalists, about his predecessor as president, his political opponents in the last election, about national heroes like John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, Senator John McCain, even the mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico? Or he's busy lying and then covering up the lies, claiming he would have won the popular vote if millions had not voted fraudulently for his opponent without a shred of evidence to support his claim, and then setting up a fraudulent commission to find the evidence. Or he's firing the head of the FBI, who wouldn't promise to be more loyal to him than to the American public. 
A president's job is to govern. Donald Trump doesn't know how to govern or apparently doesn't care. This is the essence of Trump's failure as president. Not that he has chosen one set of policies over another or even that he's lied repeatedly and chronically or that he's behaved in childish and vindictive ways that are unbecoming a president. That's all bad. But the real core of the problem is that he has sacrificed the processes and institutions of American democracy to achieve his own selfish ends. By saying and doing whatever he believes it takes for him to come out on top, Donald Trump has abused the trust we place in a president to preserve and protect the nation's capacity for self-government. This will be his most damaging and most damning legacy. And now for your questions. Uh, ben Cohn asks, whatever tax plan the Republicans pass will undoubtedly be damaging to most Americans, whether in the short term, long term, or both, undoubtedly, Republicans will attribute the negative effects to something other than their tax plan. What do you think they'll blame and to what end? Well, if the history is any guide, Ben, they raise taxes on the middle class. They make it harder for the middle class to actually purchase goods and services. They cut taxes on the rich. What happens? The economy slows. And what they do then is they blame, what, Democrats? They blame anybody they can blame. Or they'll say, well, we didn't cut taxes on the top enough. The Democrats forced us to compromise. But this is why it's our responsibility. It's your responsibility, my responsibility, all of our responsibility is to make sure that even though Republicans have control over the House and the Senate, that the public understands what is really in their tax bill. That it is a huge, gigantic tax cut for people who have never been as wealthy in the history of America. They are the ones that are going to get the lion's share, and average Americans are going to be shafted. Meredith Rose. Apparently, the Clinton camp takeover of the DNC occurred well before Clinton became the Democratic nominee. Meanwhile, Tom Perez recently purged party officials who backed Ellison from key party committees in favor of lobbyists and Clinton supporters. What do you think these events and their causes portend for the future of the Democratic Party? Well, Meredith, you know, I just wish we would stop bickering. We've got a much, much bigger and more important task and challenge. We've got Donald Trump. We've got the Republicans. Now, to me, it is very important that in 2018, we take back at least the House and hopefully the Senate. That gives us the power to at least constrain some of the worst aspects of Donald Trump. But if we start this kind of ridiculous antics again, we'll never make it. This is exactly what Republicans want. Now, I can understand why a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters are angry about what happened a year and a half ago. And I'm, you know, I was a Bernie Sanders supporter in the primaries. But let me just tell you, let's put it the past. The past is past. The most important thing for the Democratic Party is actually to take advantage of the activism and energy, the progressive activism and energy that is out there right now. Joe uh, Pekras, regarding corporate tax cuts, what do you think of the following rule? Corporations receive tax cuts only if they can show how previous tax cuts led to them creating more jobs. Joe, not a bad idea. Uh, I think, you know, you could set up a baseline. I mean, you'd have to do it for companies that were around when we had the Bush tax cuts, those are the previous tax cuts you're talking about, uh, but uh, they have to show that proportionately 
they got this tax cut, they created this many more jobs, and uh, let me think more about it. I like I like the way you're thinking, Joe. Uh, Ann Lachman, or Lachman, what's wrong with the Democrats? Why can't they win easily in Virginia tomorrow? Why is this race so close? Well, Ann, you're talking about the Virginia gubernatorial race tomorrow. And it is getting closer and closer. Uh, I think one of the reasons it's getting closer is between because Gillespie, who is the Republican, uh, he is using Trump tactics of race and racism and hatefulness, and he's making this about fear. Uh, Trump himself and Steve Bannon, Trump's consigliere, have said that this race is kind of a test of Trumpism. Well, Trumpism is about bigotry. It's about hate. It's about dividing people. And it's about using fear as a vehicle for getting political gain. That's the most cynical game ever played in America. And I hope any of you who are listening, watching from Virginia, you don't let them get away with it. Now, let me just say, in terms of not letting them get, get away with it, I, I want to remind you all of four organizations, four websites that you ought to jot down. Because these are four organizations that are doing that kind of work at the local grassroots level that need, needs to be done in terms of building the base and building the energy and mobilization for 2018. IndivisibleGuide.com swingleft.org state district sister district i'm sorry sisterdistrict.com and runforsomething.net i've interviewed here on this webpage the organizers for some of these groups and will continue to bring you their latest but jot them down make sure you have them make sure you Bookmark their, their web pages and make sure, most of all, that you use what they have to offer. These are very, very important organizing tools for making you more effective as a, an activist, as a citizen activist, which is what we desperately need. Many of you are doing extraordinary work, and I want to thank you again for your work. I also want to thank Sasha Lightman and Andrew Santana for their great, extraordinary work helping me reach you, and I'll see you soon.